everybody, this is my thoughts on E3 2021. It actually came back this year, which is interesting. And then right after the big E3 presentations, we had Steam Next Fest, which was a crap ton of demos of a bunch of upcoming games. And throughout the video, you're going to be seeing gameplay footage of the various demos that I did get a chance to play through. And since I also want to give you some thoughts on those specific games, I'm going to have a separate section in this video towards the end of it, where I'll go ahead and actually talk about the individual demos that I'm showcasing throughout the video. So I'll put a timestamp in to where that begins. Now then, let's go ahead and actually start talking about E3 itself, all the big announcements and presentations and such, in the order in which I watched them. And keep in mind that I am drawing on some notes here that I took while I was watching these presentations, and while the notes themselves are rather brief, in some cases I will certainly be able to elaborate on them. So let's go ahead and start with the very first thing that got shown for the lead-up to E3, which was the Battlefield 2042 announcement trailer. And you know what, while I'm at it, I'm gonna go ahead and roll all the other stuff we saw about Battlefield 2042 in with this. Suffice to say, after Battlefield 5, I have absolutely no confidence whatsoever that this game will even be remotely decent, let alone good. That said, I do have to admit that their announcement trailer was actually a pretty decent trailer, if only because they seem to finally be embracing the abject stupidity that is the Battlefield series. I mean, they put Rendezvous in the trailer, you can't help but be amused by that. That said, when they actually showed gameplay later on in the presentations, I wasn't impressed by it. I mean, it looks like another modern Battlefield game. Basically, an iteration on what we saw with Battlefield 4. Obviously, I'm going to reserve full judgment until I get a chance to actually play 2042, but I'm not exactly looking forward to it, and that 128-player map thing seems extremely ambitious for a studio that has had a very difficult time making maps for 64 players. But you know what? At least they can't make a mockery out of actual history in this like they did with Battlefield 1 and Battlefield 5, so it's got that going for it, I guess. That's about all I have to say about 2042 at the moment. I will be getting a copy of it eventually, but I'm not entirely sure when that'll be. And I have concerns about how well my computer is going to run it. Because we actually are starting to get games that do push my hardware a bit, and with 128 player maps, that will definitely be pushing my hardware a fair bit more than a lot of other stuff. So we'll have to see how well everything's optimized, but I do have my concerns. I'm definitely not going to be able to upgrade my rig anytime soon, unfortunately. So you're still not going to be seeing any RTX stuff, and I can't run the game with DLSS or anything like that, so it's going to be a bit of an adventure. Anyway, let's go ahead and start moving on to other things. The next thing that came up was the Summer Game Fest that was Jeff Keighley's event, where we saw a mixture of new things that were announced at the event, as well as some things that had already been announced and we had already seen, but we're seeing a bit more of. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about the big elephant in the room with that, which was the show closer, Elden Ring. And honestly, the only reason I am starting with this is so I can get it over with. It looks like yet another Souls-like game. I'm sure the Soulsborne fanboys are shrieking and freaking out over how Ermagerd amazing it is, but frankly, I don't give a shit. The fanboys can shriek and howl all they want, but I played Dark Souls and really wasn't impressed by it. I wrote off Dark Souls 2 and 3 because the fanboys were so obnoxious that I just didn't want anything to do with the other two games. And then after Dark Souls, I played Bloodborne and didn't really get much out of it either. I played Sekiro and didn't get much out of it either. And hell, I even gave Lords of the Fallen a shot, but it didn't impress either. And if my entire experience with Souls-like games is that they tend to bore the living crap out of me, why should I be excited for Elden Ring? Because it's open world now? Well, guess what? I already have something that's pretty close to that. It's called The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and you know what? It sucks too! But oh, don't worry, we'll get to that one eventually. I just have to review all of the other 3D Legend of Zelda games first, so it's gonna take a while. Anyway, let's move on to some other things that I took notes on for the Summer Game Fest. 
And we'll start with Metal Slug Tactics, which looks like a very odd choice, but frankly, it's kinda neat. I like Metal Slug well enough. I like Tactics games. It might work. I'll give it a shot when it's out. Death Stranding Director's Cut. The only note I have here is just okay. I haven't even played the base game yet, so maybe by the time I get around to Death Stranding, Director's Cut will already be out. We'll just have to wait and see, I guess. I don't know why it needs a Director's Cut when Kojima had full control over the game anyway, so there shouldn't be a need for one, but whatever. And there's Jurassic World Evolution 2. Haven't gotten around to playing the original yet, so the second one's not really on my radar at the moment. Once I have played the original game, then I will determine whether or not I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the sequel. Then there's Sable, where the only thing I wrote was neat. Looking back on it, I think I wrote that down because it's got a nice art style that I'm very fond of, but other than that, the gameplay just reminds me a lot of Journey, and I haven't gotten around to playing Journey yet, so I'm not entirely sure how playing Sable would be. It's one of those wait-and-see kind of things. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on. The next thing they showed was Lost Ark, and that's another MMO that I don't care about. The Call of Duty Warzone update that I don't care about. Free Guy, which was a Ryan Reynolds movie that looks absolutely terrible, so not going to watch that. Got updates for Among Us, which I don't really care about because I don't play Among Us. We got Salt and Sacrifice, where it's the sequel to Salt and Sanctuary. I have not played Salt and Sanctuary yet, so I don't really know much about the gameplay of it or the sequel, other than that they're side-scrolling Souls-likes. Not sure how that would work out. I'll certainly give it a shot when I get the chance, though. Next up, we have Solar Ash, where, honestly, the only thing I wrote down about it is very pretty to look at, which, in my particular case, really doesn't count for much, because I do not hold graphics at a premium like a lot of other people do. They mean next to nothing to me, and in fact, a lot of the games that I'm really looking forward to look like they came out about 30 years ago at this point. Great visuals are just a nice bonus as far as I'm concerned, so we'll have to wait and see on that one. Next thing was the new agent for Valorant, which I don't care about because I don't play Valorant and I never will. The Escape from Tarkov update, which I am still waiting for the full release of Escape from Tarkov before I even try to delve into that thing. I am not going to go through the whole reset process over and over and over again, thank you very much. Although I am still very interested in actually playing Escape from Tarkov, so hopefully they get that thing done sooner rather than later. Next up is Two Point Campus, the follow-up to Two Point Hospital, which I still haven't gotten around to playing, although I've had a copy of it for quite a while now, so I can't really comment on that too much, other than it's nice to see more games of that style. I'll certainly give Two Point Hospital a try when I get the chance, but not before I play the original game that it's based on, which is Theme Hospital, and I do also have a copy of that, and I also haven't played it either, so... Got a lot of catching up to do in that regard. That said, Two Point Campus looks fine for what it is, so if you're interested in that style of game, might be something to look forward to. Next up, there was the crossover with Stranger Things that Smite is having. Don't really care. Then there was the sizzle reel for the new publisher, Prime Matter, which is actually just a new publishing label from Koch Media, who you would know as the owners of Deep Silver, and it's just a bit of corporate restructuring kind of stuff going on there. And their sizzle reel showed some games that are already out that have been published under other Embracer Group holdings, as well as some new things that aren't out yet, including referencing Payday 3, because apparently that is something that the world needs as far as some people are concerned. Look, Payday 1 was absolute crap, and then Payday 2 was a mind-numbingly tedious grindfest, so I'm not exactly looking forward to Payday 3, which is unfortunate because the premise itself is actually quite cool. Seriously, a video game version of the movie Heat would be awesome, except that's not what Payday is. Payday is Left for Dead, but with a heist skin. So it'll take an awful lot for Payday 3 to impress me, let's put it that way. Moving on, they announced that there is a new Painkiller game in development. I do actually have something planned for the Painkiller series that's hopefully going to come out later this year, so stay tuned for that. 
but as far as the new painkiller game, they didn't really reveal anything about it at all. So there's not really anything to talk about there other than, hey, it's gonna happen eventually. So I guess we'll just have to keep an eye out for more information on it. But suffice to say, it's nice to see that the series hasn't been forgotten yet, at least. Then there was the Anacrusis, which is another Left 4 Dead clone that I'm not going to give a crap about. The Fast and Furious Cars for Rocket League, which I don't care about because I don't play Rocket League and I don't like Fast and Furious. Then Vampire the Masquerade Blood Hunt, which is, from what I can tell, a sort of Battle Royale Vampire the Masquerade game. And holy hell did it look terrible. Because you see, here's the problem with a Battle Royale Vampire the Masquerade game. It completely defies the entire point of the Vampire the Masquerade world. Because if you're not familiar with Vampire the Masquerade, the Masquerade refers to the set of rules and practices that vampires adhere to in order to keep their identity a secret from humans. Because if the humans figured out that vampires exist, then all hell would break loose and it would likely result in vampires' extinction. That's not to say that vampires don't use their powers, but they don't use them in the completely brazen and calling as much attention to themselves as possible manner that you see in the Blood Hunt trailer. So, yeah, Blood Hunt just looks awful. I'm probably not gonna bother with it, even though Vampire the Masquerade is my favorite tabletop RPG. Yeah, apparently I can't have nice things. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on. After Vampire the Masquerade Blood Hunt, there was The Dark Pictures House of Ashes, which is another series that I haven't really gotten around to yet. I'm not a horror fan. Usually I find horror games extremely boring, both from just not having very good gameplay mechanics and from the supposed horror just being a bunch of jump scares and not a whole lot else. And what I see from House of Ashes doesn't really look like anything out of the ordinary for that, so why would I really care much about it? I'm certainly not going to rule it out entirely, but when you don't really like horror games, it's not exactly easy to get excited about any of them. Moving on, we got a new trailer for Tales of Arise, which is the next game in the Tales series, and I have a whole lot of catching up with that series before I get to Arise, but suffice to say... If you like the Tales games, you'll probably like Arise. Moving on, there was some new season for the Switch version of Sky, which I didn't even know that was a thing, so I don't really care about it. And The Planet of Lana, which is apparently a cinematic puzzle adventure, as it is described. And sure, it's pretty to look at, but I imagine gameplay-wise, it'll probably be kind of boring. We'll just have to wait and see. Then there were four things that were shown that I only wrote down either meh or insert shrug here for, which are Overwatch 2, D&D Dark Alliance, some update or something for Paladins, and then Monster Hunter Stories 2. And they showed off some new models for Overwatch 2. whoop de doodle do. I don't care. Show us gameplay, and then I might actually get interested in it. And Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance is yet another co-op hack-and-slash beat-em-up kind of thing, somewhat along the lines of Vermintide or whatever, and I can't really get excited for it, and even the reviews that I've seen after it's released have not been favorable in ways that make me really just not want to play it at all, so... We'll see. Maybe I'll pick it up when it's dirt cheap or something. And the update for Paladins, I've stopped really caring about Paladins a while ago. And then Monster Hunter Stories 2, I haven't played the first one, and this one looks like Pokemon, but it's Monster Hunter, and that just seems incredibly cringe-inducing. So we'll see. I'll try to pick up both Monster Hunter Stories 1 and 2 eventually and take a look at them, but they're very low priority at the moment, so it'll be a while. Moving on, we have Endless Dungeon, which is yet another game in the Endless series and a radical departure from the other ones in that it is a twin-stick horde shooter. And I cannot remotely get excited about twin-stick horde shooters anymore, so I'm not really given much of a crap about it. And there was a Far Cry 6 thing where they just talked to Giancarlo Esposito about his role. 
so it wasn't exactly anything all that interesting. But from what they've shown about the game itself over the various conferences and all the trailers leading up to it and everything, the game itself looks fine. It looks like another Far Cry game, so hopefully they've learned some lessons from the mess that was Far Cry 5 and, of course, Far Cry New Dawn. Just have to wait and see, I guess, but I'll certainly give it a try once it's out. And there were a couple of updates, one for a 2B costume in Fall Guys, so don't really care. There was some update information for Genshin Impact, which I don't care about because I don't play Genshin Impact, and I'm never going to play Genshin Impact, so why should I care? Then there was something for Deviation Games, and I can't even remember what it was. I think it was just them saying, Hey, we're a new developer, and we're gonna make something cool! And they had nothing to show, so basically they just wasted everybody's time with that. And then moving on, there was Tunic, which looks like a fairly standard isometric-ish action-adventure game, but it could be pretty decent. I'll certainly give it a try once I can. And Tribes of Midgard, which reeks of being only good with friends, which all but guarantees a solo player like myself is probably going to hate it, but I'm going to reserve judgment until I actually give the game a try myself, although I have absolutely no idea when that'll be. And then, of course, there is Evil Dead the Game, which looks like another game that is probably only going to be good with friends. After all, it is a sort of multiplayer asymmetric horror game kind of thing. And as much as I like Evil Dead, unfortunately the gameplay just looks kind of dull. The attacks just don't seem to have all that much impact, and it seems like enemies are just damage sponges. Maybe it'll be different by the time the game actually comes out, and it'll be more interesting. And while I'll certainly reserve judgment until I actually give it a chance, I just don't know when that's going to be. This sort of game just doesn't really appeal to me all that much, even though it is Evil Dead. And now we've gotten through all of the Summer Game Fest event, except for one particular game that you're probably going, But DW, what about Tiny Tina's Wonderlands? Okay... Let me put it this way. There are currently two games that I hate so much I want them erased from existence. And I actually don't hate either of those games because they're bad. I hate them because of what they did to their genres. The first of them I've already made a video about. It's StarCraft. If you want to know why I hate that game so much, feel free to watch that video. I'm not going to go over it here. The other game I haven't covered yet, but it also did something very similar to StarCraft, but within its own genre. And then there's Borderlands, which is very quickly becoming the third of these games, not because of what it's done to a genre or anything, but because it's just so fucking obnoxious that I want it gone. I mean, you know what? It's skipping ahead, but fuck it, I want to talk about this and get it over with. There was an entire Gearbox event this time, and it was basically nothing but Randy Pitchford walking around and talking to people on the set of the Borderlands movie. And everybody was talking about how amazing this Borderlands movie is going to be, even though it has absolutely no chance in hell of being a decent movie. And to make matters even more insulting, they kept interspersing it with about five or so second clips of somebody talking about... Homeworld and how amazing Homeworld was, only to say, Homeworld 3 is in development, even though we have nothing to show for it. But oh no, we got plenty of time to devote to this movie that we're going to show you absolutely nothing of except for maybe some behind the scenes photos and talk to a couple of people who are involved in it. Oh no, 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 we got to have that. We got to have more Tiny Tina's Wonderlands trailer that we showed previously, but have basically nothing else to show about it. I mean, honestly, there couldn't possibly be people looking forward to, I don't know, say another Brothers in Arms game, or maybe another Duke Nukem game, or obviously Homeworld 3. No, pfft. Fuck all that shit, it's all gotta be Borderlands. Borderlands is what everybody's really looking forward to. Because clearly, instead of all of these varied experiences, what people really want is tons and tons of completely useless guns that they're just going to get rid of in five seconds anyway, and a stat system that is just a small incremental change, and a shit ton of fart and poop jokes. That's what people really want. Ha ha, isn't Butt Stallion so funny? Laugh, peons, laugh! No, folks, I'm not bitter at all. It's not like I've been waiting for Homeworld 3 for almost 20 years. It's not like I've been waiting for another Duke Nukem game for years, especially after they've finally gotten control of a license and been like, okay, 
Let's do nothing with it. I'm not bitter at all. Okay. Rant over. Let's move on. Next thing that happened was the Netflix Geeked event, which don't really care much about other than they announced that they're going to do a Castlevania anime with Richter Belmont, which is kind of cool because the Castlevania anime was pretty good. Then Witcher Con is apparently happening. I, okay, cool, I guess. And then moving on, there were announcements for a Far Cry series and a Splinter Cell series. I'd much rather see a new Splinter Cell game that is actually a stealth game, but okay, whatever. I have basically no expectations for those series. I have a feeling they're going to be pretty crap. Anyway, continuing on, we had Koch Prime Time, which was the event that was centered around Prime Matter, the new publishing arm of Koch Media. And it was a pretty miserable show because it was just people talking almost the entire time without showing really any gameplay. Maybe a CG trailer here or there, but not much gameplay. They didn't really reveal anything important about the new Painkiller game. They showed off Kingdom Come Deliverance on the Switch, which frankly amazes me. I am amazed they can actually get that thing working on the Switch, because it was a mess trying to run that thing even on a fairly powerful computer like I've got, let alone the really underpowered hardware of the Switch. So if they manage to pull it off, then kudos to them, but I have a feeling it's going to be a mess. They talked a bit about some upcoming horror game called The Chant. I'll be honest with you, I mostly just didn't pay much attention during this whole presentation, because like I said, it was just people talking, so I basically had it on in the background while I was doing other stuff. And so I wasn't really paying much attention during The Chant. Then there was Final Form, where they actually showed something. It's apparently some sort of sci-fi first-person shooter, but they didn't show much of it. Seems like it could be cool if they managed to pull it off. There was something called Dolman, which the only thing I wrote was eh. So I actually can't even remember what it was. Then there was King's Bounty 2, which I guess is cool if you like the King's Bounty series. I don't really care much one way or the other about it. Uh, we have known about that one for quite a while, though, so there wasn't really anything new there. Then Scars Above, where they actually showed some gameplay of it, and it actually looked pretty decent. So adding that to the list of things to get around to eventually. They had a bit about the upcoming game Encased, which is a sci-fi post-apocalyptic RPG that is very reminiscent of classic Fallout, and I've been looking forward to that one for a while, so definitely going to be picking that up when I can, and hopefully I'll be able to get a review out sooner rather than later, but honestly I just have no idea with the way my backlog works. And then they closed out their show with three games that, honestly, I didn't really pay much attention to, which were Echoes of the End, where they didn't show anything, they just talked about it. The Last Ori Crew, which, honestly, I didn't pay attention to at all. I could not tell you what that game's about at all. That is how boring their presentation was. And then they closed out with a single piece of artwork for Payday 3 and said that the game's years out. So, whoop de doodle do there. Moving on, we had the Ubisoft Forward event, and they started out with Rainbow Six Extraction. All I have to say about that is that Tom Clancy is definitely rolling in his grave. It looks so bad. It was fine as a one-off mode for a special event in Rainbow Six Siege. Just some nice, limited-time thing. As a full standalone game, though, look... Rainbow Six is supposed to be about at least relatively realistic situations and tactical gameplay, and that is not what Rainbow Six Extraction is. It's basically a zombie shooter when you get down to it, and it just looks bad. I'm sure I'll eventually take a look at it, but I'm really not looking forward to it. Moving on, they had Rocksmith Plus, which is just Rocksmith, but a subscription service. Cool if you're trying to learn guitar, I guess, but I don't really care. Uh, Riders Republic, which is not remotely my thing, so I don't really care and didn't really pay much attention to it. The Year 6 for Rainbow Six Siege, where, honestly, I'm just glad that Ubisoft is continuing to support the game. I'm amazed that it has done as well as it has, because it is Rainbow Six after all. But I actually haven't played Rainbow Six Siege in a couple of years at this point, so it's not exactly relevant to me anymore. 
Moving on, we had more content for For Honor, which reminds me, I really need to get around to doing an update video on that to see how it is now. Honestly, I'm just surprised that it's lasted as long as it has and that Ubisoft has continued to support it as long as they have, because it didn't seem like it was doing all that well back when I reviewed it. Anyway, moving on, we have more content for Trackmania, Brawlhalla, and The Crew 2, as well as DLC for Watch Dogs Legion, and some updates for Ghost Recon Breakpoint. All of which, I um, just don't really care about all that much. The only one that I kinda care about is Ghost Recon Breakpoint, because I'm in the middle of working on a review of that, eventually. No idea when that review is gonna come out, because there's a lot of game to go through. And it's, uh, it's really boring. So, um, yeah, that'll be a while. Anyway, moving on, we have Just Dance 2022, where just, just no. That, that's all I have to say about Just Dance in general. Just no. Then Assassin's Creed Valhalla DLC and updates. Don't really care at this point. I'm still working on Assassin's Creed Origins on and off, and it's still quite a ways out. And after that, I have to go through Odyssey, which I do have a copy of, I just... I need to get through Origins first, so it'll be a while before I get to Valhalla. Then we move on to the Discovery Tour Viking Age, which is certainly cool for people who are interested in that. More stuff about their Mythic Quest Apple TV exclusive show, which I don't care about, but even then it just looks really dumb. And the movie Werewolves Within, which... Okay... Why, exactly? I don't think anybody's going to be able to answer that, actually, so no point. They had a bit more about Far Cry 6, more specifically the Season Pass, where you get to play as the villains, which is interesting. I'm curious how that actually goes, although I'm not exactly expecting anything all that amazing out of it. And then they closed out with Mario plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope, which just isn't my thing. I'm not a big Mario guy, and I'm certainly not a big Rabbids guy. So, when it comes to Mario Plus Rabbids, it's just kind of a don't really care all that much kind of thing. I haven't even played the first one of those yet, although I have heard that supposedly it's really good. Maybe I'll give it a try eventually, but it's very, very low priority. And finally, they closed down with Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. And... <sighs> the Avatar movie came out over a decade ago at this point. Why are they making a game? Supposedly the sequel movie is supposed to be coming out either next year or the year after, but we've heard that quite a few times before, so I have absolutely no expectation that we will ever see Avatar 2 or Avatar 3. And yet, they're making a video game off of it now. Why? That's all I have to say. It's just, just why? I mean, Avatar was not really all that great to begin with. It was basically Dances with Wolves in space. And Dances with Wolves did it better. So... Eh... Whatever. Next event was considerably more entertaining, though, which was the Devolver Direct event where in typical Devolver fashion, they made fun of just about every industry trend they could possibly think of. And the games they showed seemed kind of interesting in general, although there were a few that were just kind of eh. There was Shadow Warrior 3, of course, but we've known about that for a while. I'm still definitely looking forward to it. There was Trek to Yomi, which seems interesting purely from the art style. It's a black and white samurai game. But the problem there is that it's basically an action platformer, and I'm not a platformer guy, so maybe it'll be good, maybe it won't, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll give it a try eventually. And Phantom Abyss, which could be neat, I'll probably give it a try at some point, but it's not really a priority for me at the moment. And there was Wizard with a Gun, which was kind of weird, but it might be neat. I'll probably give that one a try as well, not sure when that'll be. Death's Door, which is an isometric action-adventure kind of thing, and it looks pretty cool, so might give that a try eventually as well. I do like action-adventure games of that style. The only note I have for Inscription is, well, that was weird, and I think that's a pretty accurate summary of that thing. It's the same guy who made Pony Island, so of course it's going to be really weird. 
It certainly got my attention, but it's not really a priority for me at the moment. Moving on, we had Tumble Time, which the only note I have for that is, that's just plain silly. And finally, Demon Throttle, which is kind of neat. It's cool to see a physical release, but that's kind of it, really. And that closed out the Devolver event. They just didn't really have all that many announcements, and it was mostly just taking the piss out of the gaming industry, which is kind of par for the course with them, so it's definitely good to see they're still in top form with that. And the next event was the Gearbox event, which I've already ranted about, so I'm not going to go there. Then we had the Xbox conference, and that was basically all killer, no filler. I was very pleasantly surprised with that. They just didn't have people come up and start talking about stuff. They were like, no, nope, we're just going to show you stuff, and they did. And they even started off with Starfield, which I'm surprised by. I thought they would close with Starfield, but they didn't. Apparently it is coming out November 11th of next year. And thus Bethesda's trend of releasing games that I feel obligated to review but I'm not exactly looking forward to right around my birthday continues. Thanks, guys. Look, I will reserve judgment until I actually get a chance to play the game, as always. But you have to understand, Bethesda has not made a good game since 2002, and it's continually gotten worse and worse and worse over the years. There is basically no chance in hell that Starfield is going to be good. Frankly, if you are expecting anything other than a horrendously buggy and unstable, poorly written, poorly designed, downright brain-dead game, then you're just being overly optimistic about it. And while there is always the very, very slim chance that we will be pleasantly surprised by it, I'm not going to hold my breath. And speaking of not holding my breath... The next thing they showed was Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl, which is also apparently releasing next year, and I was very surprised by that because I didn't think they had started development all that long ago. I'm fully expecting this one to be garbage, just like the other ones were, but I'll give it a try. Maybe it'll actually fix the problems that the first game had. But again, I'm not going to hold my breath on that. And even if it does end up being exactly like the first game in the sense that the game is basically unplayable because it corrupts itself so much and is so horrendously buggy and unfinished, I'm sure that it will still garner a massive legion of fans that are constantly shrieking about how amazing it is. Because, you know, there's no accounting for taste. Look at the Doom Eternal fanbase. Anyway, moving on, we have Back for Blood, which I actually think I forgot to talk about in a previous event. It's Left for Dead. I already played Left for Dead 1 and 2 and was thoroughly underwhelmed by both of them, so why exactly should I be excited for yet another zombie game? Moving on, we had Contraband, where the only notes for that I have are, uh, okay, and I actually can't remember anything about it, so that's a problem. Then there was the Pirates of the Caribbean update for Sea of Thieves, which, I mean, that's a perfectly fitting crossover, so cool, I guess, if you like Sea of Thieves anyway. Then there was the Game Pass getting Yakuza Like a Dragon, which is cool if you're looking to give that one a try and aren't really sure about it. I already talked about the Battlefield 2042 gameplay trailer that they showed here, which just looks like more modern Battlefield. Yay. Moving on, we had more about 12 Minutes, which is a game about somebody being stuck in a time loop, and that seems like it could be pretty cool. I'm certainly give that a try if I can. Then we finally got a release date for Psychonauts 2, August 25th of this year. I've been waiting on this one for a while, and hopefully it will not disappoint. We'll just have to wait and see. Moving on, we have a whole bunch of stuff where I was just kind of like, eh, whatever, or outright was hostile towards. Like the Doom Eternal Xbox Series X update, which some of you may think that I am outright hostile towards, but honestly, I just don't care. I'm certainly tired of Doom Eternal this and Doom Eternal that and Ermagur Doom Eternal is the most amazingest game ever. But as for the game itself and just some updates about it, I don't give a shit. I played through it, I made my review, and I want nothing more to do with it. It's that simple. Speaking of wanting nothing more to do with it, Skyrim's been out for a decade, did you know that? Well, Bethesda wants to remind you. Ugh. Moving on, we have updates for Fallout 76, which I don't care about because that game is depressing. We have updates for Elder Scrolls Online, which I don't care about because it's an MMO, let alone I've already made a video on it and I want nothing more to do with that game either. We had something called Party Animals, which all I have for that is, uh, okay. 
it just seems really weird and I'm not really sure about it. Hades is getting an Xbox Series X port, which is cool if you like the game. I honestly just wish I liked Hades more. It's a roguelike, which means that I'm not really all that interested in it. I don't like constantly losing progress and having to repeat things over and over and over again. It's just boring. And as well-made as Hades is, and it is a very well-made game, and for people who like that style of gameplay, it is fantastic. I just can't get into it. Moving on, we had Somerville, which the only note I have for that is, huh. It's kind of reminiscent of Limbo and Inside, and if you like that kind of thing, then that's probably pretty cool for you, but otherwise it's just kind of eh. Then there's Halo Infinite, which is... Look, the single player is probably not going to be all that great, and the multiplayer being free to play probably means it's going to suck. Although, to be fair, I'm not exactly looking forward to the game anyway, because I've never really liked the Halo series all that much. I mean, Reach was decent, and the mechanics of Halo 4 were pretty solid, but other than that, I haven't really been able to get much out of the series, and I've always been utterly baffled as to why everyone seems to think that it's so amazing. Oh, and bonus points, Halo 5 isn't available on PC. It's still only available on Xbox One, so I haven't played that. I did play Halo 5 Forge a while back, and it wasn't very good, but that's beside the point. If they ever bring Halo 5 to PC, I'm sure I'll play that, and I'd frankly rather play Halo 5 before I play Infinite, because knowing the Halo series, it's going to be required to have even the vaguest idea of why you're doing what you're doing and how you got there. Although, again, knowing Halo, I'll probably end up having to go find some comics or novels to read to have the faintest idea of what's going on, even if I have played Halo 5. Oh, I hate it when game series do that. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on. The next thing they showed was Diablo 2 Resurrected. Because of course Blizzard was going to remaster Diablo 2. It's a quick and easy cash grab for them. Moving on. A Plague Tale Requiem. I actually have not played A Plague Tale Innocence yet, although I plan on doing so at some point. I'm just not exactly sure when that's going to be. Once I've gone through the first game, then I'll determine whether or not I want to go ahead and take a look at Requiem, although I'm leaning a bit more towards taking a look at it anyway, even if I end up not liking the first one. We'll see. Continuing on, another trailer for Far Cry 6. Just gonna move on. Uh, Slime Rancher 2. I don't really care. That's not my kind of game. Then there was Atomic Heart, where the only thing I have noted for that is, uh, cool, I guess? It seems odd, for lack of a better term. It's like they tried to take elements of Bioshock and mix it with elements of Metro and Stalker, and I'm not exactly sure how to feel about that. I'll give it a try once it's out and see if it's any good, though, because at least it looks interesting. Continuing on, we have Replaced, which seems rather cool. It's got a very cool aesthetic, and I'm always on the lookout for more cyberpunk stuff, so I'll probably give it a try eventually. Again, not sure when that's going to be. We move on to some more updates for existing games, Grounded, which I don't care about, and Among Us, which again I don't care about, and we get to the trailers for Aoden Chronicle 100 Heroes and Aoden Chronicle Rising. I actually was aware of these beforehand. They're basically spiritual successors to Suikoden, and I haven't gotten around to playing the Suikoden games yet, but they're interesting in the sense that they have rather large rosters of characters, and the story takes place from multiple perspectives, so that can be really interesting if done well. I have been planning on getting around to the Suikoden games eventually, but the big problem with that is that they are JRPGs, and that has a whole host of problems associated with it. I may actually do an updated MTO on why I don't generally like JRPGs, because I did a video on that way back when, and I feel like I could elaborate on that a bit better now. Anyway, the Suikoden games themselves are also quite long and quite in-depth, and I'm also missing one of them. I have yet to find a copy of Suikoden Tear Christ for anything remotely resembling a decent price. Once I have that, then I will probably start delving into the Suikoden series, because as you guys know, I tend to do things in release order. Obviously, with some exceptions, although in the case of the Suikoden games, I don't think any of them are actually related to one another from a story perspective, so that's not really the problem. It's really more seeing how the mechanics and such evolve over time. That said, 
I have other major series projects that I'm actually already working on that I'd like to get through first, like the Fire Emblem series, which I started with Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light, and I'm currently working on Gaiden, although I have absolutely no idea when that review is going to come out. And of course, there's the Legend of Zelda series, which is also going to take a while because there's just so many games in it, but we'll get around to those eventually. Anyway, point is that Aiden Chronicle and Aiden Chronicle Rising do seem interesting, and I will certainly take a look at them when I can. Moving on, we have The Ascent, which is just not really my kind of game, but it seems like if you're into that style of game, then it might be something you'd want to take a look at. And, of course, Age of Empires 4. I am beyond ready for a fresh Age of Empires game. I am also ready for it to potentially not be very good, because Relic's last game was not very good either, and that was Dawn of War 3. Ultimately, we'll just have to wait until later this year to find out whether or not it actually ends up being a hit. The next thing after Age of Empires 4 was a trailer that was making fun of other trailers, and it turned out to be an announcement for The Outer Worlds 2. Some of you have asked me what I think about The Outer Worlds 1, and the simple fact of the matter is I haven't finished the game yet. I started playing it when it was on the Game Pass until I eventually decided to buy the game on Steam once it was finally available on that, and I went ahead and got it along with the Season Pass, so whenever I end up reviewing it, I will also be able to include all of the DLCs. I'm not sure exactly when I'll be able to get a review of The Outer Worlds done, but suffice to say, now that I've sorted out a few technical problems that I was having with it previously, hopefully that will be sooner rather than later. We're still quite a ways out from the release of The Outer Worlds 2 though, so I might actually end up waiting until closer to The Outer Worlds 2's release in order to get that review done. We'll just have to wait and see, I guess. Moving on, we had more stuff about Microsoft Flight Sim which is not my particular kind of flight sim. I like combat flight sims, not just flight sims. And so it's not really something that appeals to me, but it is really nice to see Microsoft Flight Sim back. And I do have to admit that the Top Gun crossover is kind of cool. But then we closed out the Xbox conference with two games, one of which I don't care about at all, which is Forza Horizon 5. Simple fact of the matter is that I find racing games to be extremely boring, and most of that comes down to the fact that I simply don't like driving. I don't like driving in real life, nor do I like driving in video games. So unless it's something silly and ridiculous like, say, Mario Kart, I basically write it off entirely, and even something like Mario Kart I really only like when playing with friends. So yeah, Forza Horizon 5, don't care. If that's your kind of thing, then you're welcome to it. But then they closed out the presentation with Redfall, which is a new game from Arcane Studios, apparently. And they showed nothing except a CG trailer, so we don't exactly know what kind of game it really is, other than it's going for a slightly humorous tone and vampires are involved. Ah, uh, whatever. It's probably going to be kind of Left 4 Dead-ish, and if it's like that, then I'm not really going to be able to get much out of it. We'll see. When it comes out, I'll give it a try and probably cover it on the channel, if nothing else, because I feel obligated to because Arcane Studios, but I'm not really looking forward to it. So thus ends the Xbox conference, and we move on to Square Enix. Oh, Square Enix, what have you done to yourselves? We'll go ahead and start with the first thing they showed off, which is the new game from Eidos Montreal. Some of us were hoping that this was going to be another Deus Ex game, because it's been quite a few years since the last one, and the time seems ripe considering Cyberpunk 2077 happened and was big even if it was controversial. And before you ask, I am still working on a review, I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but it's not going to be until much later this year at absolute earliest, simply because I have so much catching up I need to do. So please just be patient on that one. Anyway, what Eidos Montreal is actually working on is Guardians of the Galaxy, where you play as Star-Lord. You know what? I'm done with Marvel. I've been done with Marvel for a while now. They have oversaturated the superhero market, and I'm just tired of it. Hell, I've had the PS4 Spider-Man game sitting on my shelf for a long time now and haven't even bothered booting it up. So I have a feeling that Guardians of the Galaxy is going to be one of those games where if I do ever take a look at it, it's because I got it for dirt cheap, because I'm certainly not going to be looking forward to it. 
And the worst part about the Square Enix presentation is the majority of it was for Guardians of the Galaxy, which meant that the rest of it barely got touched on at all. Like the Final Fantasy Pixel remasters, it's of the first six games, but not in the Octopath art style like they're doing with, I think, Dragon Quest III, if I remember correctly. I may be misremembering. There's way too much of this crap to keep track of. Anyway, point is that they are rebranding the 3D remakes as actual 3D remakes and are are making these pixel remasters that are much closer to the original art styles of the games. Which is cool, but not really something I'm all that excited about. I mean, I already have all of those games anyway, so why should I care about pixel remasters of them? I mean, I know why I should care about them. It's so that other people can get the chance to experience those games where they may not have been able to before. And that's certainly cool, but it's not really something I'm looking forward to. Moving on to another remaster, the Legend of Mana remaster, which I haven't gotten a chance to play the original yet. I do have a copy of it, but like with a lot of JRPGs, I didn't really mess around much with the Seiken Densetsu series. I did mess around a bit with Secret of Mana, but I never really got very far into it, and that was the only one I really played. You may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, what, Seiken Densetsu, what, that's the Japanese name of the Mana series. Seiken Densetsu 1 is actually Final Fantasy Adventure, which is incredibly dumb. Seiken Densetsu 2 is Secret of Mana, and from then on out, it was just the Of Mana series in the West. There's your brief history lesson for those of you who aren't familiar with the series. At any rate, I haven't gone over the Seiken Densetsu series, mainly because I am missing two of the games. I have yet to get a copy of Sword of Mana, nor have I gotten a copy of Dawn of Mana yet. I have all the other ones, so once I have all the games in the series, I will be looking into doing a series of reviews on each game in the series, starting, of course, with Final Fantasy Adventure, a.k.a. Seiken Densetsu. As for the Legend of Mana remaster, it's something we've known about for a while now, and I will be picking up a copy of it eventually, and will probably be doing a review mainly on the remaster, just because it's a lot easier for me to record that than it is for me to record the PS1 Classics version of the game that I have on my PS3. And, of course, in that video I will talk about the differences between the original game and the remaster, so that's something for probably fairly far in the future. Anyway, let's go ahead and continue to move on. They talked about the Avengers game, and the only note I have for that is Fuck Off, which honestly I think should speak for itself with that game. Anyway, moving on, they had a fairly brief section on a bunch of mobile games that I'm not gonna really give much of a crap about because they're all mobile games. Hitman Sniper, Near Reincarnation, some Final Fantasy mobile gotcha crap, and then Final Fantasy VII The First Soldier, none of which I give a single solitary crap about because I don't really play mobile games. Then they had Babylon's Fall, which, uh... Sure looks like a platinum game. That's basically all I got on that. It could be good, but I've never really been all that into the style of game that Platinum is very good at. It's not that they're bad games necessarily, it's just that it's never really been something that I've messed around with all that much, and so I don't really have enough exposure to the genre to really know whether or not I actually like it. So that one ends up being a very low priority for me. Besides, I have a bunch of other games of that style that I need to get around to first, like, say, Nier Automata, meaning that I have to go through the first Nier before I go through that, as well as the Bayonetta series, and so on and so forth. It's all gonna happen eventually, although I have no idea when. Moving on, we had the bit about Life is Strange remastered, as well as Life is Strange True Colors, and while we had known about True Colors for a while, I think this was the first time they announced the remaster of Life is Strange. And the prevailing thought I had with that is, why does this need a remaster? Because it looks fine. The original game has a specific art style and is not particularly realistic, so it still holds up just fine. It didn't need a remaster, but here we are, I guess. As for True Colors, well... I have a whole bunch of Life is Strange games I need to go through before I even consider going through True Colors, so it's very low priority. Looks interesting enough if Life is Strange is your kind of thing, though. And then we had the, uh, the real showstopper for Square Enix. Oh boy, this one was bad. Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin. 
by the guys who made Neo. And here's the thing. Mechanically, it looks very similar to Final Fantasy XV and Final Fantasy VII Remake. But as far as the writing and acting goes, it's the stuff of legends. Because he's here to kill chaos. Did you know that? Because he will remind you about every five milliseconds. Because he is T-Shirt Man! The mortal enemy of chaos! And he's here to kill Chaos, because Chaos is evil and needs to be killed, because he is Chaos. It's just, look, this thing could be a parody of the absurd, nonsensical, idiotic writing you see in a lot of Final Fantasy. But I know it isn't. I know they put it together in utmost sincerity, and thus they have created one of the most unintentionally hilarious things I have seen from Square Enix in a very long time. And what's even funnier about it is that even the Japanese audience were like, what in the hell is this thing? <laughs> so if nothing else, Square Enix has absolutely struck gold with the idiotic nonsense in this one, and it will be a sight to behold once it finally releases. But that rounds out the Square Enix show, an overall extremely underwhelming and frankly kind of irritating mess, but at least we got the hilarious nonsense of Stranger of Paradise. But that's not what we got out of the PC gaming show, which was weapons grade cringe. And most of the announcements I don't really have a whole lot to say about, so I'm just gonna go through the ones that actually were kind of interesting to me. Humankind, the upcoming 4X strategy game very much along the lines of Civilization, from the guys who made Endless Space and Endless Legend. It still looks great, and I'm still very much looking forward to it. War Tales. The trailer itself was actually pretty crappy, but the game looked like something right up my alley. Stay tuned for my thoughts on the demo after all of this E3 discussion. Next up, they had a bit about MechWarrior 5, which I played a bit on Xbox Game Pass, but wasn't really all that impressed by from what little I played of it. I'm sure one of these days I will eventually get around to doing videos on the entire MechWarrior series, but I don't know when that'll be. It'll certainly be in sequence though, starting with the very first MechWarrior game, then moving on to MechWarrior 2 and its expansions, and so on and so forth. So it'll be a while before you see a video on MechWarrior 5 specifically, unless of course it's just a how-to-fail clip. Continuing on, eventually they had the New Blood Games showcase, and they didn't really show anything and made a joke out of cutting them off, and that was incredibly irritating because I was actually looking forward to more stuff on Gloomwood, more stuff on Fallen Aces, etc., and I had to go elsewhere to get that information, so that was actually pretty irritating. I know they thought it was funny, but it wasn't. Moving on, they talked a bit about Steam Next Fest, which I will be talking about more later on in this video, but suffice to say, Steam Next Fest is very cool. Eventually, we got to see something about Sacrifier, which is the new game from the people who made Regalia of Men and Monarchs, and they had a Kickstarter, which I believe is actually successful, so hopefully we'll be seeing that game fairly soon. It looked kind of interesting. And they eventually had a thing on Tinykin, which looks very Pikmin-esque, and I was actually surprised we haven't seen more Pikmin-styled games than just the Pikmin series, and even Nintendo has seemed to mostly forget that series exists. Which is a real shame, because Pikmin is rather unique. Anyway, continuing on, we had Chernobylite, which has always seemed kind of neat to me, but I've never really gotten around to taking a look at it. I'm not exactly keen on the horror aspects of it, because usually those tend to be rather boring in the games they implement them in, but I'll give it a shot and see what it's like eventually. Again, not sure when that's going to be, though. There was a thing on Mecha Jammer, which seems kind of cool. I'll certainly give that one a try once it's out as well. And then there was The Wandering Village, which looks very different and very interesting, and I'm very curious to see how that one turns out. And then there was Death Trash, which seemed really cool from the trailer, and there was a demo available on Steam Next Fest, so stay tuned for more about that one. 
And then the last thing that was kind of interesting from the PC gaming show, at least as far as I was concerned, was Project Warlock 2, where I'm hoping that it fixes some of the problems the original game had and really picks whether it wants to go more retro or more modern, because that was one of the bigger problems that the original game had, where it couldn't really pick whether it wanted to be a retro shooter or a more modern shooter, so it mixed elements of the two and just didn't really satisfy either craving. We'll see, though. I'll definitely be keeping an eye on it, and as soon as I can get a copy of it, I will certainly do so and take a look at it and see if I can get a review out as soon as possible on it. But that about wraps up as far as I'm willing to talk about the PC gaming show anyway. I will be perfectly honest with you people, I only half paid attention to it because the weapons grade cringe was so bad that I was just trying to do other things while that was on in the background. Oh, and speaking of weapons-grade cringe, there was the Limited Run Games show, which at least was seeming to try to make fun of the cringy elements of other things, so it had that going for it. But most of the announcements were just kind of a, eh, that's kind of neat, but I'm not really all that excited about it, because they mostly do physical releases of digital games, which is certainly very cool, but it's not exactly something I get really excited over. I mean, sure, it's nice to see classics like Zombies Ate My Neighbors and Ghoul Patrol being brought back. It's nice to see them doing physical releases of the various Castlevania games. And it's nice to see physical releases of a bunch of indie titles that otherwise wouldn't be able to get physical releases if Limited Run didn't do them. But it is hard to get excited over physical releases of games that have been out in digital form for several years at this point. Although it was fairly amusing to see plumbers don't wear ties among their lineup. Because that game, if you can even call it a game, is legendarily terrible, and nobody in their right mind would ever want to buy it. Which is probably why I'll end up getting a copy of it at some point, whether I want to or not. Because if nothing else, you guys like to see me suffer. Anyway, that was the limited run game show, so let's go ahead and move on. The Capcom show was just redundant of things that they had already shown, which were Resident Evil 8, Monster Hunter Stories 2, Monster Hunter Rise, and Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Now, I don't really care about Resident Evil 8 at this moment, because I have a whole lot of Resident Evil games to go through before I get to that, and the same sort of thing goes for Monster Hunter Rise, Monster Hunter Stories 2, and even the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, because I haven't gotten around to the Ace Attorney series yet either, so I got a whole lot of catching up to do. It's pretty ridiculous at this point. At any rate, Capcom's event was an absolute waste of time, so the next big event was Nintendo's. And while a fair bit of that included things we already knew about, like the new Mario Golf game, or Just Dance 2022, or letting us know that Metroid Prime 4 is still in development even though they had absolutely nothing to show for it and have absolutely no idea when it's going to come out, they did have a fair few new announcements, one of which is the first 2D Metroid game in almost 20 years, which is Metroid Dread. Now, I will be fair here and say that I've never been much of a fan of the Metroid series, partly because I just never played them back in the day, and partly because they're platformers, and I am so burned out on platformers that I basically can't get excited over any of them, no matter how good they actually are. I can certainly appreciate them from a historical standpoint, and if it's a very well-made platformer, I can certainly appreciate that, but as far as actually playing platformers goes, even the ones I do like, I don't really get much out of anymore, so Metroid Dread is something that I might take a look at eventually, but it's a fairly low priority sort of thing. Obviously, if you're a fan of the Metroid series though, then this is fantastic news. Moving on, they started with the announcement of Tekken characters being added to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, which is certainly very cool if you like Smash Bros. and you like Tekken, but it certainly seems like an odd choice to me considering that there haven't been any Tekken games on any Nintendo systems, at least as far as I'm aware. I'm just not sure how much those fan bases really intersect, so I'm not really sure how much mileage people are really going to get out of that. Still, it is pretty cool to see. They also announced that Mario Party Superstars is happening, which is cool if you like Mario Party, but I've always been fairly ambivalent towards the series. It's one of those series where it can be fun to play with friends, but other than that, it's just kind of a novelty at absolute best. They also announced another WarioWare game, which is interesting. It's been quite a while since we've had a WarioWare game, so it's nice to see that they remember that's a thing. And speaking of Nintendo remembering series exist, they're bringing the Fatal Frame game that was released on the Wii U to the Switch, which is 
certainly cool. Maybe we'll see more Fatal Frame games. It's another series I haven't really gotten into, partly because the games are surprisingly difficult to track down now, and partly because they're horror games, and you guys know me in horror games at this point. Continuing the theme of Nintendo remembering they have certain series, they're also bringing back Advance Wars, specifically Advance Wars 1 and 2, which are getting the sort of Link's Awakening remake treatment, which is certainly cool, although I frankly would have just liked to see more Advance Wars games. Or, you know, just re-release the older games because they still hold up just fine, actually. It's another series I really need to get around to reviewing at some point. Anyway, moving on to other announcements that were made at the Nintendo show. The release date for Shin Megami Tensei 5, which was really funny to me because I was seeing people complaining that it looks like Persona and they're just copying Persona. Meanwhile, those of us who've been around for a while are like, you do realize Persona is a sub-series of Shin Megami Tensei, right? And those people obviously don't know it. Hell, if you want to get really technical, Shin Megami Tensei is itself a sub-series of Megami Tensei, but it was more or less that Megami Tensei turned into Shin Megami Tensei. It's a complicated series, there's a lot of games in it. It's gonna take me a long while to get around to reviewing any of them, especially because they are really, really long games and they tend to be extremely grindy, at least from my fairly limited experience with the series. I think the Persona series is a bit less grindy than the mainline Shin Megami Tensei series is, but as far as the whole series goes, the only one I've put any real amount of hours into is Strange Journey on the DS, and while it certainly lived up to its moniker, and it was certainly an interesting game, unfortunately, the gameplay mechanics were just really tedious, so I just never finished it. I'm sure eventually I will get around to doing some sort of videos on the Shin Megami Tensei series, including Persona, but I have absolutely no idea when that'll be. That said, it is cool that we do finally have a release date for Shin Megami Tensei 5, so there is that. Anyway, rounding out the Nintendo show, at least as far as the announcements that I wanted to discuss go, were the Game & Watch for The Legend of Zelda 1 and 2, as well as Link's Awakening, which seems like a bit of a waste to me, but hey, at least they're doing something for the anniversary. And finally, of course, Breath of the Wild 2, which they showed another trailer for, and that was pretty much it. There's no release date, there's not even a subtitle yet, it's just the sequels of Breath of the Wild. And all I really have to say about it so far is that it just looks like more Breath of the Wild, which is not necessarily a good thing, because Breath of the Wild sucks. Well, at least by the time Breath of the Wild 2 comes out, my review of Breath of the Wild 1 will probably be done, so you'll at least understand my problems with that game, and hopefully they will fix the issues I had with Breath of the Wild in the sequel, but considering it looks like they're also incorporating elements from Skyward Sword, which was also not very good, I'm not gonna hold my breath on that. Guess we'll just wait and see. Like I said, hopefully by the time Breath of the Wild 2 comes out, my reviews of all the other Zelda games will be done, so... It's a ways out, they don't have a release date for it yet, it's likely at least one or two years in the future, so... We got plenty of time in that regard. But that about wraps it up for all of the E3 events this year. The Nintendo event was the last big one before they had Bandai Namco do their thing, which ended up being just an interview with a guy about the Dark Pictures Anthology House of Ashes. And that was it. There was nothing else in that. It was a complete waste of everyone's time. Because everybody basically went into that event expecting, well, maybe they'll talk a bit more about Elden Ring, or maybe they'll talk more about, say... DLC for Soul Calibur 6 or other games that they're doing, but nope, just House of Ashes and nothing else. So that basically made E3 go out on a particularly pathetic whimper, and that leads me into Steam Next Fest, where we got a chance to mess around with demos of a lot of upcoming games. And while I didn't get a chance to mess around with all that many demos, I will go ahead and talk about the ones I was able to try out. So let's go ahead and start in alphabetical order. So the first of these games is Agent 64 Spies Never Die by Replicant D6, which is described as a retro FPS inspired by classic 90s console shooters. Specifically, it's referring to GoldenEye 64 and the original Perfect Dark. 
And while you might think that when it says it's going for that classic feel, it's referring to just the way the levels are designed or the way that you have gradually increasing amounts of objectives as you continue to go up in difficulty settings, that is technically true, but it's also even down to the gunplay. Because they even put in the auto-aim system and lack of normal crosshair, like in the original GoldenEye and the original Perfect Dark, where if you're just walking around and looking around, then the gun will actually automatically start tracking enemies. And it's kind of funny that the store page says it is inspired by these shooters because it goes more than simply inspiration. Because this is an extremely accurate recreation of the gameplay style and especially the gunplay of the original GoldenEye. You really don't worry about precision. You walk through the entire levels with a relatively slow movement speed but you rely almost exclusively on the auto-aim to take down enemies very quickly. Because it very quickly tracks them and you can very easily start shooting at enemies as soon as they're in your line of sight. There's only one real problem with that. While it is an extremely accurate recreation and this very much felt like going back and playing Goldeneye again, I don't really play first-person shooters on PC to get the Goldeneye experience. It's actually kind of funny just how integral the Nintendo 64 controller is to the experience of playing the original GoldenEye. Because if you only have that one analog stick, then the style of aiming and shooting that it has feels completely natural. Because it was developed specifically for those limitations. And while it's certainly not as fast or smooth or accurate as you would see with later games that had dual analog stick support, or especially PC games, it's fine for the Nintendo 64. When you take that gameplay style and put it on a keyboard and mouse, it feels awkward, for lack of a better term. Partly because the mouse sensitivity is very low by default, so it feels like you're actually struggling against the aiming rather than the aiming working in your favor. Thankfully, you can bump up the mouse sensitivity, and that does help quite a lot, but it's still really awkward playing a PC game with mouse and keyboard controls that really forces you to rely on the auto-aim rather than using the precision and speed of the mouse that you're used to, like in just about any other first-person shooter. And so Agent 64 ends up being a bit of an odd one for me, because on the one hand, it is absolutely fantastic at recreating the feel of playing Goldeneye, but with the advantages of running in widescreen and running on a more modern engine, and of course running at a much higher frame rate. But at the same time, that style of gameplay feels kind of awkward on a keyboard and mouse, and more importantly, this thing is relying almost entirely on the nostalgia factor. As such, this is really only going to appeal to people who played GoldenEye back in the day, and that means that the amount of people who are going to be really interested in playing Agent 64 is probably going to be fairly small. So I guess it's a good thing I've always liked GoldenEye, huh? At any rate, I will certainly be keeping an eye on Agent 64 as it continues development, and hopefully once it's fully out, I can do a review of it. Next up, we have Death Trash, which is a game by Crafting Legends that is slated to release in August, and it is described, I just have to read this off to you, as featuring a post-apocalyptic world where cosmic horrors long for humanity, but meet punks with shotguns. And honestly, if you're not on board after that, then I can't really say anything that's going to persuade you otherwise. It's an isometric action RPG that apparently has an emphasis on freedom, although I found that combat was more or less unavoidable. And the combat system is... not great. It's okay for what it is. It's basically a twin-stick shooter with a melee component to it. And while the shooting component is perfectly serviceable, the melee component probably needs some work. I found myself constantly getting hit, no matter how much I tried to dodge out of the way of things, so I'm not sure if it's just the range of enemy melee attacks is a bit too long, or if the dodging itself doesn't quite get you out of the way enough, or if my stats weren't quite there. But the end result was a whole lot of me saying things like, Damn it, I dodged that. Why did I still take damage? And it ended up being fairly frustrating at times, especially considering the very low damage that I was doing compared to how much damage enemies were doing to me. 
So one of two things needs to happen with that. Either there are some issues with the actual programming that they need to fix, or if it's not an issue with the programming and it's just because I apparently suck at video games, then they need to explain that better. They need to explain it better in the tutorial instead of what they actually give you in the game, which is a very, very basic tutorial that more or less just gives you the controls and that's about it. Cue people in the comments being like, hey, hey, it's because you suck at video games, DW, you need to get good. And by the way, any of that that's actually in the comments, I'm just gonna ignore it, so don't even bother. As far as Death Trash itself goes, though, from what relatively little I experienced in the demo, I found that the dialogue was actually quite solid. The setting was very interesting, and it's got a pretty cool aesthetic despite being pixel art, which is admittedly a bit tired at this point. And while that combat did get fairly frustrating, it wasn't anything that couldn't be fixed. I do have concerns with things like the stealth system, though, because no matter what I did, it seemed like I would always get detected. I could be hiding behind things and in full stealth and I would still get spotted. I could be in stealth and then move past an enemy that was facing away from me. And they would just immediately turn around and spot me almost instantly no matter what. And it just ended up being frustrating as well. So much like with the combat, they need to do some ironing out of the stealth system and make it so that players are more aware of the mechanics. And if there are tweaks that need to be made to the AI to make stealth more viable, then they definitely need to be doing that as well. But other than those issues, the rest of the game seems pretty solid so far, and I'm very curious to see how this turns out when it's eventually released. And as a bit of a bonus, this is one of the relatively few Steam Next Fest demos that is actually still available as I'm making this video. In fact, they decided to make the demo permanently available, so if this one looks interesting to you, you can just hop on Steam and download the demo for free and give the game a try. Now, unfortunately, not all the demos were like that, however, and Dread Templars was one of those. This is a first-person shooter developed by T19 Games and published by 1C Entertainment, and it is a retro throwback shooter, and a relatively standard one at that. The graphics are retro-styled to make it look somewhere along the lines of the old-school Quake games, despite running on a modern engine capable of rendering considerably more advanced effects, and the game does take advantage of a few of those. It does a very good job with the retro aesthetic, and when you run around and blast the living crap out of things, it generally feels pretty good, although the shotgun accuracy is a bit wonky, in that you can be at pretty close range and have that crosshair on an enemy and still miss them, which is a bit weird. Not really sure what's going on with the shot pattern there, but when you do actually hit things with the shotgun, it's pretty satisfying because it does quite a lot of damage and in a lot of cases you will jib enemies into tons of meaty chunks, which is always satisfying. That said, the shotgun sound effect is a bit on the weaker side, unfortunately, and the enemies themselves can be a bit bullet spongy. It does have an upgrade system, although the demo doesn't really give you much of an opportunity to mess around with it, so I'm not sure how that would influence the game going forward, but the general gameplay experience of Dread Templar from the demo was pretty solid. It's fast-paced, the movement feels good, the weapons themselves generally feel good, although again, the enemies can be a bit damage spongy. And while the level design wasn't exactly all that impressive in the demo, it was decent enough, so it looks like Dread Templar is going to be a pretty solid all-around retro throwback shooter. Based on my experience with the demo, I'm not entirely sure it's going to be anything especially amazing, but at the very least, if you're looking for a pretty solid retro throwback shooter, it looks like it's definitely going to fit that bill. Hopefully by the time the game finally releases, it'll have ironed out some of the issues and will be considerably more than just a solid first-person shooter. Although if it ends up being just a solid first-person shooter, it still might be worth playing, especially if you like these retro throwback shooters. Next up we have Industria, which is a first-person shooter developed by Bleak Mill and published by HeadUp that is set around when the Berlin Wall falls and you end up going into an alternate reality where there's robots and such. And the demo didn't do an especially good job of introducing all of this. It drops you into the prologue bits, as far as I can tell, where you're just wandering through an office area, and then you step into a machine, and then after that it skips ahead to the alternate reality where you have a bunch of guns and you're fighting the robots. And while it does introduce you to the mechanics of walking around and interacting with things and, of course, shooting stuff, 
it doesn't do an especially good job of setting up the world in a way that makes you interested to continue. The demo was maybe 15 minutes long at most, and that was including me wandering around and looking at things and reading readables and such like that, so if you just go straight through the thing, it's maybe five minutes long at most. There really wasn't much on offer with this particular demo, which is disappointing because from the trailers and the screenshots and such, it seems like a pretty interesting game. I'll still be keeping an eye on it, but after having played the demo, I'm a lot more apprehensive about it than I was previously. I mean, I know the game's not finished yet, and the demo is just a chunk of gameplay that they have relatively complete, and they have a whole lot of optimizations and such to do, but the game really does not run very well in its current state, at least as of the demo, and the gunplay felt rather basic and unrefined, so hopefully they can sort that out by the time it finally launches. But I do have to say, as far as the demos I played through on this particular Steam Next Fest go, I really wasn't impressed by Industrias at all. Here's hoping the full game impresses quite a lot more. Next up we have Lost Idolans, which is a tactical RPG or KRPG, I guess is the best way to describe it, considering that it was developed by a Korean studio, Ocean Drive Studio. But suffice to say, it draws very heavy inspiration from the Fire Emblem series in particular, which is of course what got me interested in the game in the first place. Now, I do have to say that as far as the demos go, it did have a fair amount of content in it, but it really did not explain itself well at all, and it is very painfully obvious that this is a very early development version, because even though the visuals are actually quite impressive, unfortunately it's all very unrefined. There is absolutely no voice acting at all, and some of the animations just look unfinished. It also certainly doesn't help that this is lacking some basic convenience features like skipping combat animations or disabling them entirely, which is something that you see most people who play these sorts of games frequently doing almost immediately when they start one of these games. Obviously that sort of thing can be added in later on though, so I'm not that concerned about it at the moment. What I did find concerning, however, were the very basic nature of the gameplay mechanics, and the fact that the demo just dropped you in with relatively high level characters, all things considered, and just expected you to figure everything out on your own without any explanation whatsoever. I mean, sure, because I've played a lot of Fire Emblem over the years, it was relatively easy to pick this up, but if I hadn't played Fire Emblem previously, then I would have probably jumped into this and gone, what am I doing and how do I do it? Obviously, it's not a deal breaker with a very early development demo like this, because this is just meant to get the game out there to the kind of people who would be interested in this game to begin with, and they probably have enough basic understanding of the mechanics to be able to just pick it up and play it without much problem. But it is going to be a problem if they don't have a relatively comprehensive tutorial in the actual full release. But what about the rather basic gameplay? Well, part of the problem with that is that this is a very early development demo, so I'm not sure how much they just haven't implemented yet that they plan on implementing later, and because there's no tutorials or anything, it's rather difficult to tell exactly what kinds of strengths and weaknesses certain characters might have over others. To give you an example, in Fire Emblem you have something called the Weapon Triangle. Swords beat axes, axes beat lances, and lances beat swords. It's a very simple principle, but you have to understand that to be able to excel at Fire Emblem. Meanwhile, I'm not sure if Lost Eidolons has anything similar as far as fundamental mechanics go, because it didn't tell me, and I had no way of finding it out while playing the demo. This is a significant problem for any sort of tactical game, whether it's a tactical RPG or not. But to bring this back to the inspiration of Lost Eidolons, if you weren't told about the weapon triangle in Fire Emblem, for example, you would find yourself wondering almost immediately why the Axemen are doing so much more damage and hitting more frequently on characters that have lances, and the lance characters are hitting so much more frequently and doing so much more damage against guys with swords, and the guys with swords are doing so much damage and hitting more frequently against the guys with axes. Obviously you'd figure it out eventually, but in the case of the older Fire Emblem games it would be a particularly nasty problem. Because they all have permadeath. If one of your units goes down, they're out for good. 
So you would find yourself incredibly frustrated, constantly restarting battles, and eventually you might even just give up on the game entirely because it didn't tell you the fundamentals of what you need to be able to actually play it properly. That's almost where I was at while playing the Lost Eidolons demo. It was very pretty to look at, and the basics were all very familiar to me having played the Fire Emblem games, but if there were any sorts of complexities with the character class dynamics, or the types of damage you're doing, or any sort of status effects, I was more or less lost on that. In fact, there were several moments where a status effect was applied to one of my guys, and I was like, wait a minute, why can't I attack with this character now? At first I thought it was a glitch, but then I managed to cast a spell on an enemy unit and it applied the same status effect, and I was like, oh, that's what's going on. There's a status effect that the game didn't tell me about. So they definitely need to work a lot on making everything much more clear for the player and making sure that the game has tutorials in place to be able to explain their mechanics. At the same time, they also really need to work on the encounter design because what ended up happening with the demo missions is that it was more or less like trying to play the Fire Emblem games on a pretty high difficulty setting because it was throwing you up against a lot of enemy units, all of which were about as powerful as each of your own units. And that ultimately turned the encounters into battles of attrition. And that sort of thing is just not fun in a game like this. It renders battles into tedious slogs that you just don't want to deal with, especially when you can't skip the animations. So they've definitely got a lot of work they need to do on this game, and that even extends to the outside of battle stuff. Because you can run around your camp and interact with all of the units that you've recruited over the course of your game, and also complete various quests for them to raise your relationships with them, as well as get additional bonuses, things like money, or maybe you get some extra training in, or something along those lines. That's all well and good, but in its current state is, much like the battles, very unrefined, and they just need to do a lot of work to clean it all up. So what you end up getting with Lost Eidolons is something that is really early in development despite its rather impressive visuals, and while it does certainly have promise and it's nice to see more games taking the Fire Emblem gameplay style and trying to do something different with it, Ocean Drive Studio has a long road ahead of them with this one, and I will certainly be keeping a close eye on it because, after all, I am a Fire Emblem fan and it's nice to see more games like that coming to PC. Next up, we have Mortal Sin by, I'm probably going to butcher this, Nikola Todorovic. I don't know how to pronounce that, I'm sorry if I mess that up. Which is described as an action horror roguelike, and the idea is that the monsters that you will be fighting need to be dismembered in order to be defeated. Kind of like in Dead Space. It's a fairly neat concept, but what really drew me in was the art style, which is very striking and unique. But it turns out the thing that drew my attention in the first place ended up being the game's biggest problem. Because I found after only a couple of minutes I was already getting a really nasty headache from it. Normally if I'm getting a headache from playing a video game, particularly a first person one, it's because of FOV issues, but that wasn't really the problem with Mortal Sin, so I'm not really sure what it is about the art style, but it was just giving me a headache and I had to stop playing after about 15 minutes. It's a shame too, because the mechanical base of the game was actually pretty solid. It's a timing based combat system where you can time your blocks to do a quick counter attack that does a ton of damage, you are targeting limbs to chop them off to end up doing more damage against the enemy, as opposed to just running up and whacking them repeatedly, and the weapons do feel like they have some weight behind them, which is always nice, but none of that really matters when the game is physically painful to play. Next up we have the demo for Severed Steel, a first person shooter developed by Greylock Studio and published by Digerati, and it is clearly quite heavily influenced by the likes of Fear and John Woo movies and such like that, because you have a whole lot of acrobatics you can do, whether it be running on walls or diving through windows or sliding along the ground and such, and you can go into slow-mo to get better shots at your enemies. But aside from its influences, the game does some interesting things of its own, namely the fact that the protagonist only has one arm, which means that you don't reload in this game. You just grab a new gun as soon as you can. You can run up to enemies and kick them, and that will usually cause them to drop their weapons, 
and you can just snatch their weapon out of the air and blast the living crap out of them with it. And whenever you run out of ammunition, you can also throw your weapon at the enemy for a similar effect to the kick. It's all very fast-paced and stylish, and it also is surprisingly difficult, because you really can't take all that much damage in this thing before you go down, and the main way you're going to be avoiding damage is by using as many acrobatic maneuvers as you can while also taking down enemies as quickly as possible. Sometimes that might even involve shooting enemies through walls, because this game actually has destructible environments, although you don't really get to see all that much of that in this demo, because the demo does not give you access to the arm cannon, which will allow you to melt holes in walls. So if you want to be shooting through walls, you have to expend quite a few bullets to actually punch a hole in the wall, but you can still do it, and that all ends up being really satisfying. It really helps that there is direct audio-visual feedback whenever you take down an enemy, so you immediately know that that one is no longer a threat, and you can move on to the next enemy. And when everything's firing on all cylinders, you have a very acrobatic, very fast-paced, and very stylish game. There's only two problems with that. The first is simply that the game's not finished yet, so there is still a fair bit of jank in the mechanics themselves that they need to sort out by the time the game launches. I'm actually not all that concerned about it, considering the fundamentals in the game are strong enough to where, even if they don't sort out the jank, it's not really going to be that big of a problem. But the other problem is something that is not the game's fault at all. It's that I am really terrible at it. A lot of that is simply from not being able to get used to the mechanics during the time I was playing the demo. This is a rather technical game, so you need quite a bit of time and effort to get used to the mechanics and get the rhythm down, which is not something you're really going to get from a fairly short demo like this was. That said, I wasn't really expecting to be able to adjust to the mechanics completely in the course of the demo, because it is, after all, a very early pre-release demo that is a very limited section of content from the game. So I'm not going to hold that against the game at the moment, and I am definitely going to be keeping my eye on this one because it is a very cool game, and I'm very curious to see how the full version turns out. And the last demo I took a look at for Steam Next Fest is War Tales, which is described as an open-world RPG, but it's really closer to a management and tactics game than anything else. It's very reminiscent of Battle Brothers in the sense that you control a group of mercenaries who each have their own individual stats and their own individual skills, and as you continue to progress through the game, you'll be gradually recruiting more members to your group, as well as improving the skills and such of the various members that you already have, as well as taking on various jobs that will get you paid, and that is important because you need to pay your group of mercenaries in order for them not to abandon you. Now, the demo was actually surprisingly sparse on content in the sense that it only lets you play about seven or so battles before it decided to arbitrarily end, so you really don't get much opportunity in the demo to do any exploration or see if there's anything beyond just wandering around and fighting things. And the combat in this was actually pretty simplistic. Now, some of that's probably because this is very early level content, but even then, I was already seeing situations where pretty much every fight was devolving into get your guy behind the enemy and then hit them for quite a lot more damage than if you were to hit them from the front. And that was pretty much it. It's flashbacks to the conga line of death in older versions of Dungeons & Dragons. But anyway, hopefully that's something they'll sort out by the time the game actually launches, but suffice to say, there wasn't really a whole lot of meat on the bones of the demo. And what made it a bit worse in that regard is that you have to engage in battles to be able to pay your mercenary group. Because you have to pay your mercenaries every three days. Otherwise, they start to get mad at you, and if you continue to defer payment, eventually they will just leave your group entirely, which will of course leave you effectively defenseless when you start running into groups that are much larger, and which track you down before you get a chance to get away from them. So I can already see where the game's economy can be a serious problem. If they continue to keep that three-day payment limit, then I could see the game getting extremely frustrating very quickly because you'd want to be wandering around and exploring and seeing what all kinds of random stuff you can do, but you can't because you have to constantly be going back to town and turning in bounties and then getting new bounties and going out and completing those and just going right back and forth from the same place you already are just to keep your group afloat. Battle Brothers has a similar 
similar problem, especially in the early game until you finally get access to contracts that will pay enough to where you can actually have your group live on those wages for a while. This game is probably aiming for a similar difficulty curve, where as you continue to progress and your group gets larger, you gain access to better and better contracts that will pay more, but obviously I can't be sure of that considering that the game only let me play seven battles before it abruptly ended, and throughout all of those, the jobs barely paid enough to satisfy one set of wages. So I guess we'll have to wait for the full game to see on that, but suffice to say in the demo it was a bit frustrating. That said, War Tales does show some promise, so I'll be keeping an eye on it, and when it's actually out, I will certainly be picking up a copy as soon as possible, and hopefully doing a review on it sooner rather than later. But then again, you guys know how my schedule is. It can be an absolute mess to try to work anything in, so we'll just have to wait and see. And that wraps up the section on the Steam Next Fest demos, which means that this whole video on E3 and the Steam Next Fest for this year is finally at an end. Thanks for bearing with me during the whole thing there, I know this was a really long one. And it unfortunately got delayed a couple of times because I kept having all manner of issues with it, both from recording issues on up through editing issues, and, and my video editing software even crashed several times throughout the entire editing process. And one of those crashes even caused the project file to get deleted, although thankfully I had a backup so I could restore from that. Yeah, this, this video just ended up being an absolute mess to make, so thanks for bearing with me during all that, thanks for bearing with me on the delays. I hope you all enjoyed it, and if there's something I missed throughout all of the E3 craziness and didn't cover it in this particular video, feel free to ask me about it in the comments, I will probably answer it there. At any rate, now that the E3 video is done, I have a whole lot of catching up to do, so I'm going to go ahead and get right back to it. Thank you all again for watching, and I will see you all in later videos.